First of all, I'd like to make a few announcements. There is more uh, water on the way. For those of you who are looking for it. Um, so, I'll be here in a few minutes. Everyone, please, uh, please take your seats. I'd like to, uh, to start this second session by um, by reading, actually, uh, the remarks uh, that we were sent by uh, Congresswoman uh, Shelley Berkeley and, and Congressman Elliot Engel, who uh, could not make it at the end of the day, but they sent uh, a few words. So I'm just going to read them quickly, because I think it's important for the audience to hear uh, how, how seriously Congress takes this issue. Uh, Congresswoman Berkeley said that after 20 years, it is clear that the Oslo process has sadly not yielded much uh, success. In order to truly achieve peace between Israel and the Arabs, we must bring together all parts of the spectrum, left, right, and center, and include all their ideas in the debate. Any effort to do that is a step forward towards peace and stability in the Middle East. And uh, Congressman Engel said, uh, I would like to thank the IACF for bringing former Knesset members, uh, Rabbi Benny Alon and Dr. Yossi Balin, to Washington, D.C. for this groundbreaking event. In the past, Rabbi Alon and Dr. Balin have been adversaries, but today they come together to work for a true and lasting peace in the Middle East. In order to solve this conflict, leaders from all ends of the political spectrum must work together. And I congratulate today's participants for putting politics aside to work for peace. So uh, the only other technical announcement I need to make is that uh, Munar Saran, the uh, Palestinian Jordanian journalist who is going to speak to us live via teleconference, uh, is not able to make it either because we've had some serious technical difficulties. So we're just going to move uh, directly into this uh, second panel. So with that, I'd like to call our moderator, Dr. Jonathan Chancellor, back up, and let's get started. Okay, thank you, Willem. And uh, um, we're about to start our second panel here. Just a, a quick note, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, if you haven't already, to turn off your cell phones. Seth and Stun, we've had a couple of, uh, of interruptions. It feels very Middle Eastern, but um, let's not go there. Um, this panel, um, I think, promises to be extremely interesting. We've got three uh, journeymen um, uh, from, uh, from this uh, conflict slash uh, peace process up at, uh, at the dais. Um, this panel should hopefully uh, discuss what happens next. We just had a panel that looked at what went wrong, and we know that we probably just scratched the surface there. Uh, but I think the important thing here is to be constructive, and that is why we're convening this, uh, this panel here today. Let me make a few introductions. Uh, first, we've got Rabbi Benjamin Alon, who's the founder of the International Israel Allies Caucus Foundation, and former Minister of Tourism under Ariel Sharon, who founded the Beit Baruch Talmudic College and then served as a member of the Knesset from 1996 to 2009. Rabbi Alon represented the Moledit Party that is now part of the National Union. Uh, known for his steadfast opposition to the Oslo process, he suggested an alternative proposal to the two-state solution known as uh, the Elon Peace Plan, which involves Israeli annexation of the West Bank and Gaza, creating a Palestinian state in Jordan. Uh, then we've got there Aaron David Miller, uh, who was an advisor to six uh, secretaries of state here in Washington. He is currently the public uh, policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, and he sits on the U.S. Uh, Advisory Council of the Israel Policy Forum. Uh, he's author of four books uh, and uh, his articles in op-ed pieces that have appeared in the speech publications. Most recently, uh, a very amusing one in foreign policy, which I think has been made available for you today. Uh, and then to his left uh, is uh, Dr. Yossi Bailey, who is a former member of the Labour and Merit Yahad parties in the Israeli Knesset, serving as chair and spokesman during his career. He serves as Deputy Finance Minister and Deputy Foreign Minister under Shimon Peres. Later, he served as Minister of Economy and Planning, Minister in the Office of the Prime Minister, and Minister of Justice. Uh, Dr. Bailey is considered the architect of the Oslo Accords. He signed the white paper known as the Bailey Abu Mazen Agreement in 1995 and participated in the Israeli Palestinian Taba Talks in 2001. Needless to say, we've got a very senior panel here. Uh, what I'd like to do, just as I did in the prior panel, is to have each of you get up for five minutes and uh, present some opening remarks, um, realizing that you've not written anything, but really to just give us your thoughts 
as to why we are here and maybe some thoughts about moving forward. I will give you, as I did in the last panel, a 30-second warning that your time is uh, coming to an end. And once we've done that, I will ask a few questions. And as happened in the last panel, we will open it up to a broader discussion. So uh, with that, uh, Rabbi Alon, if you'd like to begin, please. Shalom, first of all, uh, it's a real honor to be here, and I want, uh, I want to say that even I'm a little bit excited, really, I, I believe that uh, always peace uh, has to start at home, like that, like a charity, like uh, all of the good things that we ask from others, and the, the very fact that uh, really we are here, and I always said the respect to Dr. Benny as an individual that uh, did a lot in diplomacy, more than anyone else that I know, just as a solo. It's, uh, of course, not according to my wishes and, 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 and understood, understanding. And uh, I really believe that it's not cynical, that we both can sit and show that inside Israel, uh, there is a way to talk and to speak, and it's, it's meaningful by itself, first of all. Then, I'm not going to cover the, of course, the things that uh, divides us, but I think the things that makes us one or more uh, influential and more important than things that divide us. We both Zionists, and I really think that it's very, very important to understand what Zionism is. And here I start. We will never have peace if uh, we should not uh, understand that Zionism means, after all, that the people of Israel were turning to Zion. There are many explanations. There were many movements in the Zionist movement. And I, of course, believe that this is the biblical vision that uh, we are seeing it, we see the fulfillment of uh, this vision that the people of Israel, after so many years of suffering, exile, are back in Zion, back in Jerusalem, back in Israel. This is the beginning of everything. And if uh, our neighbors, Arabs, and I'll speak now about Palestinians, Arabs, will insist to say, okay, but it doesn't say nothing to us. We are not obligated to it because of the Quran, it's not exactly there. We see you as foreigners. We see you as people who don't belong there. We never have peace. I'm sorry that I'm starting with this because it is very, very important to understand the other side. And I understand the other side. I understand if they don't believe, and if they don't see any, any, any rational explanation. Why people? Okay, take someone that uh, left in a message that he is uh, out for lunch, for two hours, and it took him 2,000 years, and then he says, I'm back. <laughs> okay? Just think how they see it. And if this is the situation, we have a real problem. And I, I can't force it on them. I can't force my faith and my understanding on the other side. But it has to be clear if we don't want to waste another 20 years and larger and larger and larger. And, and that's why I appreciate very much what Gates said before. He said it on his behalf. He, he was careful not to say it on behalf of Palestinian Authority or some other body. He said, yes, the, to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, it is so important. If I, I don't quote you exactly, but that's what I understood. And it is very important. Shalom, Congressman Engel. Maybe after my five minutes? 
I, I think that I have only a few seconds. So you can see it. And, uh, uh, so this is the beginning, and uh, it's not my solution. I really believe in peace. I really believe in, a, in an option of diplomatic negotiations in order to achieve peace on the ground. I don't, I don't think that what I said in the beginning belongs to another dimension of messianic dimension or biblical dimension. The Bible is our inspiration, and I believe that we have to pursue peace in every means, diplomatically, politically. We have to prevent bloodshed, but we have to pursue peace for the sake of peace, not just in order to prevent bloodshed, because it's something that we all have to have. This is my great opening, and I'll deal with that after we do it. We're just going to take a moment uh, to uh, recognize uh, a few congressmen who have come uh, to participate today and then also to ask uh, Congressman Engel to, uh, to speak for a minute. Uh, thank you, Congressman uh, Greg Harper, for coming, and uh, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan. Uh, Elliot Engel is, is one of our uh, co-chairs of the Congressionals for Allies Caucus, and uh, we'd like to ask him just to come and say a few words before we continue. <coughs> Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I walked by without tripping over anything, so that's a that's a that's a plus. I uh, was uh, in a markup, uh, so I was supposed to introduce Yossi before before us. So I know he doesn't need any introduction. So hello, and welcome to Washington. And of course, Benny is always always here, and always <laughs> always making trouble. You know, and, 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 uh, that's why we love him. Um, the only thing that I, I can really say, and I, I was on uh, this morning, I was on live at, at, at 7.30 on, on C-SPAN doing their morning journal a program talking about Syria and the events there and, and what happened. Uh, I, in 2004, uh, I was the author of the Syria Accountability Act, which slapped sanctions on Syria, first time in the United States did it, and those sanctions are now all fully uh, put out. Um, and so we had a discussion about, about, uh, about that. Um, it's been a joy for me to be co-chair of the uh, Israel uh, Allies Caucus with my, with my good friend Trent Franks. You know, the um, Congress uh, has a well-deserved reputation of not uh, working together. Uh, it's a shame because I believe we need to work together. Um, but if there's one issue that we do work together, and it's the strong support uh, for Israel. Uh, and I think that is very, very important that Democrats and Republicans of all persuasions, from the left to the right, uh, come together because we realize that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, and Israel is the only, I, the only reliable U.S. ally in the Middle East, and so we need to do everything we can to strengthen uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship. That's why I'm proudly the co-chair of the Israel Allies Caucus and work uh, very closely with, with Trent Franks. He and I may have disagreements on some other issues, but when it comes to Israel, we're, we're united as one, and I respect him greatly, and it's very important that Israel have support in the United States and across the political spectrum. It's very, very important, and I think we can, we can do that. Um, obviously, uh, many of us have hoped that by this time, uh, there would be uh, a uh, agreement, a peace agreement. Uh, there is, hasn't been. And the thing that um, irritates me the most is um, I don't see on the Palestinian side uh, any inclination to uh, make a peace with Israel. Uh, I think that um, we have to look at the situation as it is, not as we might wish it to be. And what irritates me is the uh, absolute uh, refusal of uh, the Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Um, they won't say those words, even though you can go back to the 1947 UN resolution, which uh, divides Palestine into a Jewish state, quote unquote, and an Arab state, quote unquote. And here it is 60 some odd years later, and they can't get the words out of their mouth. So you really wonder, uh, can they ever accept a Jewish state? Um, you really wonder about that. And if the answer is no, uh, then you wonder why 
um, there is an illusory uh, attitude that we can somehow bring the parties together to make peace. If this one side refuses to recognize the other side's right to exist, uh, it would seem to me that it's difficult to make peace. Um, but hope springs eternal, and I think we always must try, but not be naive about it and go into it with our eyes wide open. And I think the United States must continue to play a major role. And one other thing I wanted to say is that I know there are some who say that the United States should be more even-handed, whatever that quote means. Um, and I say the United States, uh, I don't want even-handedness. Uh, regardless of whether one side is right or wrong. You know, if one side is right and one side is wrong, if you're even-handed, you're half wrong. Um, I, I, I want, uh, you can applaud, it's fine. My, my cousins, they're applauding. Uh, uh, I want the United States to stand strongly behind Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, the only country that shares the values of the United States. Israel and the United States uh, uh, work together and have a lot in common, not because of, of the, the enemies of Israel will talk about some lobby or some whatever or some anti-Semitic thing. The United States and Israel have stood together because we both believe in democracy. We both believe in the rule of law. There are certain vital principles of foundations of both societies that we have in common. And so when you look at what's there and happening in the Middle East. You, know, you talk about democracy, the Arab Spring, this happening, everything happening. Well, in Israel, democracy is there year in and year out. And just like in the United States, it may mean at times leaders are elected that maybe we don't like or didn't vote for. But that's what democracies are. It's true of American citizens and it's true of Israeli citizens. And finally, let me say this. You go to the United Nations in my hometown of New York, and you see the, the one-sided uh, votes that come out of the United Nations year in and year out. You know, in New York, we call that chutzpah. Um, and for those of you who, who don't know what that means, it's unmitigated goal is really what it means. Um, when you have the one democracy in the Middle East always being uh, chastised and castigated by the United Nations, which have, makes up a majority of countries that are dictatorships and undemocratic. It, it, it's certainly uh, disgraceful and hypocritical, uh, to say uh, the least. And so I think it's important that regardless, you know, presidents come and go, prime ministers come and go, even members of Congress come and go. I don't want to go so fast. <laughs> but the U.S.-Israel relationship needs to remain firm, it needs to remain strong. Because when, when the enemies of Israel know that there is no daylight between the United States and Israel, that's when they realize that they cannot make unjust demands and try to force Israel into doing something that no nation would ever do, undermine its own existence. But when they realize, again, that we are together as one, that's when they realize that it takes two to tango. And yes, we want peace. We finished by saying what I said when I started. But we have to look at it as it is, not as we wish it to be. It takes two to tango, and I know enough of my Israeli friends that if there is a genuine desire for peace from the Palestinian side, then there will be peace, because Israelis want peace. But they want a real peace, not an illusory peace. And that's why it's important that all of you here, and important that the Israel Allies Caucus continues uh, to spread the truth. So thank you all. I've got to run back to my markup, but it's really a joy to see so many people here. And welcome to our <laughs>
And it's appropriate to this gathering because civility is more than politeness. It's more than the capacity simply to acknowledge the fact that someone who you may fundamentally disagree with has a right to express their views. Now, civility, he argued, was much more fundamental. Civility is the capacity to actually decide that something your adversary, your opponent, with whom you may fundamentally disagree, may arguably be worthwhile and constructive in order to actually solve a problem and further your own agenda. In America, we have lost any sense of civility. And uh, my mother-in-law, for example, will only watch MSNBC. My brother only watches Fox. On Monday, I, I did Fox and MSNBC within the space of an hour, once with Pat Buchanan and once with Andrea Mitchell. The notion that somehow there is something called the truth and that a side to most problems in life has a monopoly and how to resolve it is illusory. It defies common sense, it defies logic, and most important, it defies history. And the defiance of history comes with a cost and with a price. In my view, when I put my time in a quarter of a century working for a half a dozen secretaries of state, we failed far more than we succeeded in matters pertaining to the Arab Israeli conflict. In my view, a smart American policy and the dividing line between smart and wise American policy is not between liberals and conservatives, not between those who ascribe to the left and those who ascribe to the right, not between Democrats and Republicans. A wise and smart American policy is divided into two categories, dumb and smart. And the question is, which side of the line do you want to be on? I would argue those are life choices, and that pertains to people's personal lives, as well as the advancement in foreign policies of nations. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, a author I admire greatly, once said that, this, that the hallmark of, of a sophisticated mind is the capacity to reconcile the yes and the no. The yes and the no. And as I look at the problem at hand, that's what I see as the greatest challenge. The no is that the two-state solution, as conventionally described, needs three things in order to succeed. It, it needs leaders who are masters of their political houses, not prisoners of their political constituencies. And by the way, leadership is critical. Six men, six, were responsible between 1920 and 1950 for most of the death, destruction, devastation, and prospects of hope and peace and prosperity for much of the Western world. Six men. Anytime there's been a breakthrough in this conflict, the one you're dealing with, it's because men, largely men, almost all men, were able to transcend their political constituencies, take risks, and advance their interests. Whatever those interests may be, they were men of power and even of vision. We don't have leaders like that today on either side of the line. You can whistle past the graveyard on this one. I don't care. They're not there. The Sharons, the Begins, the Rabins are gone. They're gone. And on the Arab side, the Sadats, the Husseins, and even the authoritarians, the strong men of the Arab world, they're gone too. We have a leadership deficit. Second, you need urgency. There is no compelling urgency today, in my judgment, or not enough to push Israelis and Palestinians to make the critically important choices that need to be made, whatever solution you want to propose. There's not enough pain or gain. And finally, there's no agreement on the ultimate vision. That's the no. The yes, and I laid this out in my foreign policy article, and we can come back to it, is the two-state solution is too big to fail, even while it's too big to succeed. And therein lies the anomaly and the challenge for all of us.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll have uh, Dr. Bailey come up for five minutes as well. Thank you very much for inviting me. I must say I was surprised by this invitation. But uh, Benny will uh, testify, did not hesitate for a minute. It is important for me to meet with you because uh, you are friends of my country. And I welcome such friendship. The question for me is what is the basis and what is the aim of this support. My Zionism is not only returning to our ancestors' uh, country. It is very important. My Zionism <coughs> is having a sovereign Jewish state whereby nothing like this old story of uh, seven decades ago of the, the, the boat uh, Struma will happen again when about 700 Jews went away from Nazism in Romania and were stuck in Turkey where no country in the world, including this country, was ready to accept them. And what my parents wanted and what I want and my, my kids want is that forever there will be one state in the world which will have no quota for Jews, which will accept everybody. Now, if, God forbid, as a result of our arguments, the Palestinians are not, uh, are not supporting this, the, the Jewish idea, they don't want to have a Jewish state, they are not democratic enough, they are still uh, inciting against Israel, they don't have Israel on their map, and so on and, and, on and so, uh, so forth, which might be right, might be wrong, generally speaking, it is right. But if we say because of that, we will never make peace with them because they don't deserve, deserve it. This is again my, my interest. My interest is not necessarily a Palestinian state. For years I was a proponent of a Jordanian Palestinian state. This was the, the platform of the Labour Party, if you remember. The first Prime Minister who spoke about the Palestinian state, you know who he was? He was the leader of the Likud. Ariel Sharon. He was the first Prime Minister who delivered a speech in Latrun, near Jerusalem, and said, I support the Palestinian state. So this is not the dream of my life. Of course, I don't want my neighbors to suffer. I don't want anybody to be under occupation. I don't want to have refugees. All this is true. But what I need is not two state or Jordanian state or whatever. What I need is a Jewish majority forever in a democratic Jewish state. And if there is no line between us and them, you can applaud forever to annex the West Bank and the settlements and whatever. What will happen in three, four years? <coughs> a Jewish minority dominating a Palestinian majority, and then what? Then what? What will happen with all your support that we deserve to, to annex the, the, the settlements? That we will become a non-Jewish state? This is the, the aim. This is why I'm not with you. Or you are not with me. This is not our, this is not the support for me. The support for me is finding a line between us and the Palestinians, assuring the Jewish state forever. And then of course, pray, act, and, and whatever we can in order to have peace in our in our region, based on the the, the very surprising idea of 2002, which did not become a real story in the world of an Arab League which is saying, if you make peace with Palestinians, we will all make peace with you and forget the Khartoum idiotic resolutions of 67. This is, in my view, support for Israel. And a word about the Oslo Agreement. The Oslo Agreement is not an ideology of the leftists. It's, it is an idea which was born in 78 in the Cape David Accords of Menachem Begin and, and Anwar Sadat with, with uh, President Carter. The idea was to have a five-year uh, interim solution 
and uh, towards the two last years of the uh, of this period, the, the parties will have a, a debate about the permanent agreement, and in the meantime, there will be a Palestinian authority. This was the then in Madrid in 1901, Shamil and Baker repeated the same idea of the five years. And then was the, the, the talks in Washington. Now, <coughs> 30 seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you have 30 seconds. <laughs> we created, and I'm taking it upon, my, upon myself, a back channel. That's all. That's all. In order to solve the problems which were there in Washington in the talks between Israel and the very artificial Jordanian, uh, Jordanian Palestinian delegation, which, as you might remember, went always to Arafat to get his uh, uh, his blessing, and uh, went back then to the territories. And we said, let's don't be idiots. Let's don't be idiots. And Aaron Welder, <laughs> we, we should talk to the people who are actually uh, ordering them what to do rather than to, to, to the delegates. And this was Oslo. Now, what happened to Oslo? The extremists on both sides said, give out. It's the end of the world. The Palestinians said, the extremists on the Palestinian side said, oh, we are not going to, to lose the, our dreams about Jaffa, Haifa, I don't know what, Celia. The, the extremists on our side said, OK, now this is a division of, of the land of Israel. We cannot uh, accept it. And they fought against it in, in a very violent uh, way. The result was, and this is, in my view, the, mainly the, the, the assassination of Rabin. I believe that had Rabin not been assassinated, I cannot prove it. We would have, have now peace with the Palestinians. But the, the point was that in a process, Oslo, which was meant to be a corridor, became a living room. Everybody is happy. <coughs> Who is holding now Oslo? Yossi Bailey? The, the last man on the, in the world. Oslo was an interim solution for five years. This was not my ideology. It was a technical idea. Who is holding Oslo? <coughs> the right in Israel and, and those in, the, in Palestine were against the, the peace process because they say it's, it's an unbelievable idea. We have a kind of a solution. The world doesn't deal with us because they know that something has been solved. In the meantime, we could continue with the settlements, and we, we do not have to, to find a, a division uh, line. And the, the, the Hamas in Palestine and others are saying it is a wonderful solution because we don't have to divide the land. Both sides, on both sides, there are people who do not want to divide the land, and they are happy with Oslo. And this is why I believe that it is time to think about something else, which is if we cannot get to the permanent solution, let us at least get to an interim solution according to something that both sides agree. And this is the roadmap. The second phase of the roadmap, a Palestinian state in, a, in provisional borders, might be right now when the, the rightist Israeli government is not ready to pay the price for peace. They can speak about peace as long as they want. They are not going to do this because they are not ready to pay the price. On the Palestinian side, you have uh, Hamas and, and uh, Fatah, it is very difficult to proceed with them, an interim solution which will be implemented only in the West Bank for, for a while, but recognize the Palestinian state, might be right now, if we are speaking about the future, <laughs> maybe the only solution. Okay, thank you very much for those opening remarks. Uh, this will be a, uh, a conversation about the future. But given who we have at the table here, I have a question that I'd like to ask that does look backward for a moment. Uh, I think many people uh, in this room can recall the moment where um, they believed that the Oslo process had sort of come to its natural conclusion. I can recall, for example, living in Jerusalem in 2000, right as the Intifada broke out, uh, seeing armored vehicles go up the street in, on Betzalel Street in Jerusalem where I was living. And I remember thinking at that moment, this looks like the end of the peace process. You have all come at this from very different places, and you have all, uh, I mean, I know Rabbi Alon has been opposed to this from the beginning, but uh, Aaron, you've been involved in this from basically the beginning, Dr. Bailey as well. 
I'm curious, at what moment did you begin to realize that this paradigm uh, had gone foul? The paradigm didn't die. I mean, those who were against peace with the Palestinians still believe the same, and those who were supporting it are still there. It is not the death of a paradigm. It was an interim agreement which has to end on May the 4th, 1999. Since nothing happened on May the 4th, 1999, we should have ended it then. This is the whole story. It is not that people thought maybe the, the best thing in our life is to make peace with the Palestinians, and the paradigm collapsed, and now they say we have to, to fight against it. It is a very, I mean, the, the assumption in your question, in my view, is wrong. Aaron? Look, and, and I, I would build on, on, on Yossi's point here. It, the Egyptians and the Israelis uh, came together with one another and actually reached an agreement, and so did the Israelis and the Jordanians. And the reason those imperfect <coughs> treaties, and they are imperfect, I mean, let's be clear, from both, from the standpoint of both sides, is imperfect. The reason they, they've been sustained is because they're each based like a good marriage, a good business proposition, and a good friendship. They're based on a balance of interest. On a balance of interest in which each side gets at least, to quote the Rolling Stones here, not what they want. Nobody in this process gets what they want. There's no perfect justice this side of heaven. <coughs> I'm not a religious man. They get what they need. They get what they need in order to sustain the agreement and to sell it. I mean, nobody in life gets 100% of, any, of anything. I mean, where have we been? What world are we all living in? Oslo was fundamentally flawed because by philosophy, by definition, by construct, it could never have produced the kind of balance of interest that was required in order to end a conflict that is fundamentally different than the ones the Israelis and the Egyptians negotiated, or the Israelis and the Jordanians. But the application of the principle, however divergent the processes, remains the same. <clears throat> and Oslo could not answer the mail. If you ask me the moment that became fundamentally clear, that this heroic effort could no longer be sustained by the courageous individuals, including Vaith and Yossi and others, was Rabin's murder. And by the way, I agree with Yossi. I mean, you know, man plans, God laughs. If I could change two things, if I had the power to change two things over the last 20 years, I would change this. Rabin would not have been murdered. And despite the dismay of most people in this room for one of my former bosses and an administration, which, by the way, was the last effective foreign policy we had in this country, in which we actually succeeded, Bush 41, had Bill Clinton not defeated Bush 41 and had Rabin lived I think the odds are very high that we would have had one agreement. Now, whether it was with the one Yossi and Gaith may have preferred, or between the Israelis and the Syrians is another man. But Rabin's murder ended and put, a rest, put the rest to the illusion that Oslo could in fact have succeeded. As you said, I don't. Uh, <clears throat> as you said, I don't need a moment. Uh, I think it was a stillbirth from the beginning, and I'll explain why. But if I just uh, may, with due respect, it reminds me. I know personally a few old communists that really believe that if. Trotsky still was, instead of Lenin, everything was okay. <laughs> I don't agree with them. And I really think, with due respect, that uh, if this uh, assassinated criminal that, uh, that assassinated the late Prime Minister Rabin, 
when you do it, <coughs> the elections that came a year after it, they brought down the Labour Party, the bloodshed that was on the streets, people forgot. The disappointment from the government, uh, the demonstration that in this event Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated in Tel Aviv was created in order to encourage him, to give him the feeling that he has a few that are with him. Because wherever he went, wherever, this was the situation. And I, I know that he was quoted many times, this one that I don't want to mention his name, this criminal that did it. He believes that he changed the history. He believes it. I don't believe it. So. I think that the opposite. It made a big delay. Immediately after the assassination, seven cities uh, transferred to the, to the Arabs uh, with no objection. The right wing in Israel went inside shelters for many, many years. Yes, Netanyahu, in spite of the assassination, became prime minister and it was a change. But it was in spite of the assassination. I can't prove my feelings. And I don't think that there is. Oslo, or this thing, or this thing, the wrong thing was that we created our competition. We, we, we did not occupy six, in 67 the territories from Palestinian Authority. We liberated it, or we occupied it, named as a world, from Jordan. And we, we have models for peace in many places in the world. Take the Zaslav case. You have Germany, you have France, and there is a disputed territory in between. You can give it to France, you can give it to Germany, you can have some compromise, functional compromise, territorial compromise. But we, in Oslo, created a new state that never was in the history as a state. We gave them, we created the ticking bomb. It was just a question of time when the explosion will come because we really, really, and we have to be frank, we really didn't want to have a real two-state solution. Israel never meant to give the Palestinian state Air Force, the right to sign foreign agreements, all of the prime ministers, they always wanted to, to have some nice Palestinians that will be under our control, to give them independence and to tell them which kind of independence we give them. It was just a question of time. It can be as an autonomy of Israel, of Jordan, of something in between, but you cannot create Germany had a lot to lose with no peace with France. France is France even without Elsass Lorraine as well as Germany. Jordan and Israel with dispute territories can negotiate and, and, and find a regional solution to create an independent entity that has no meaning only those territories that you are disputed and speaking about them is to create your competition. And then it's just a question of time. This was, I think, the wrong concept. There were many mistakes. And if we are speaking about tomorrow, what we should do and where we are going to, to go, I think we have to deal with it. 
we have to deal with this real issue <coughs> of Palestinian state. Today it's changed. Today, two-state solution is not already. We have uh, three or four. We have one in Gaza, Jordan, according to me, the majority of Palestinians. So today we're speaking about four state solution: one Jewish state and three Palestinian states. One in Ramallah, one in Gaza, and one in Jordan. But that's for I spoke too much. Moment, Rabbi, yeah. You're going to have to work on your analogies because the, the Trotsky, the Trotsky Lenin imagery, frankly, is when applied to Rabin or Netanyahu, or draw distinctions between any two Israeli prime ministers, frankly, is not only wrong, it's it's really inappropriate. You know, and talking about communists, I mean, it was Marx who said that men make history rarely as they please, but they do count individuals in life particularly ones who are prepared to risk and who have authority and legitimacy, really count. And we need those kinds of, of leaders. OK, uh, what I want to do, I, I knew it was a little dangerous to, to look backward, but now I want to look forward. Uh, <laughs> what I'd like to just ask very quickly is, or maybe not so quickly, we're looking right now at some drama that is building uh, in the region as well as here in New York at the United Nations. The Palestinians are set to make another run at a, a declaration of statehood. Um, we don't know whether it will be for official membership of the United Nations to be the 194th country of the world, or if it will be something akin to the Vatican, which would, I think, make Mahmoud Abbas the Pope. Um, uh, but the point is, we've, we're looking at a, a unilateral action that appears to be outside of the Oslo process um, that would perhaps uh, dissolve the Oslo process nevertheless. Um, my question is, what happens? What happens to the PA? What happens to all the infrastructure that we've talked about on the day after? Does it change anything? Does it change nothing? Uh, we know that this is something that's looming, and we haven't heard much out of Jerusalem or Washington. Anyone? This one will go the way uh, of the last one. The same sort of buildup, Jonathan, occurred in July and August of last year. And more sensible people argued that very little would change. And frankly, very little did. Because the region is now engulfed in events and trends which are so much more consequential than the narrow, legal, or even moral point of finding a full statehood for Palestinians rather than a real one, which would accrue out of negotiations that, frankly, I'm not entirely sure anyone's going to pay attention to this. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is how do you deal with the status quo that ultimately will not become manageable? And the options that are put forward on the table are the ones that are well known. There are those who dream uh, illusions of a one-state solution. And you know, countries don't last forever. In the arc of history, maybe 500 years from now, there will be one state. But it won't be now. And I, I, I think states don't just disappear. And this tiny state with its dark past living on the knife's edge isn't going to disappear either. And it's an illusion to believe that it will. You could go to the Jordanian option again, the one that Yossi referred to, and the one that American policymakers explored until the late 80s. That's also based on an illusion. The notion that a weak Hashemite king, surrounded by the Arab Spring and the Arab Winter, is somehow going to take risks with respect to incorporating large numbers of Palestinians, even politically, into his domain. It's another illusion. That only leaves two variants, frankly. One is the status quo, minus annexation. And by the way, the Israelis did not annex the Golan Heights. The Israelis extended administrative law to the Golan Heights. And there's a very important difference in 1981. If various Israeli prime ministers negotiated, or including the current one, only the fourth Israeli prime minister to serve in not two non-consecutive terms, also expressed a fundamental interest in negotiations with the Syrians. So some variant of the status quo which involves 
continued conflict accommodation. Sometimes it'll get hot, sometimes it'll, it'll get cold, sometimes it'll be worse, sometimes it'll be better. Or what I would argue is the reality and the illusion of the pursuit of the two-state solution, which, as I pointed out in my piece, lock and, light, light rock and roll is never going to die for the reasons that I identify. And we can do, everyone in this room can think what they want, they can do what they want, they can express all kinds of support for other alternatives and options, but unlikely during the next, let's say, five years, the course of the next administration, whether it's a second term Obama or a first term Mitt Romney, this idea, five years from now, so that would be what, 2017? Right. We're still going to be talking about it. And nothing anybody in this room or outside of this room, nothing they can do is going to change that reality. I, I'll say it again. It's too big to fail, and it's too big to succeed. And therein lies the paradox and the anomaly of the challenge. Sorry, Adrian. Dr. Bailey, or more yes, that's quiet. Yeah. You want to unsubscribe? That's okay. Dr. Miller, uh, I have to say that uh, it makes sense to say. I still believe that we have to, to wish and we have to do whatever. We believe, and we have to put things on the table. I follow your way. Let's say, and you said right. Politically, every president in America, every prime minister, he said, we be very careful with Jordan because we don't want to. It's a nice and sympathetic government to the West. I think better than, but. I remember how everyone tweeted Mubarak just yesterday. And uh, who is going to tell us what's going to be in Jordan if they will have Arab Spring? And I don't see why the Arab Spring will stop there tomorrow. Why we cannot prepare our homework, cannot prepare some options that they will be ready on the table? I agree with you. I agree with you that if I was now in office, I really was very careful to touch everything, to move Iran, nuclear, Arab Spring, and very, very, very careful. But things have to be on the table. I think that what Dr. Bailey did, I hated it then, <laughs> until today, but I admired it, as I said in the beginning. He prepared his homework, he was not lazy. And he did underground that surprised America or disappointed America and Israel. It's not so exactly that it was the natural continuation of Madrid. It was something against the legal status in Israel that did not allow negotiations with Palestinians. And he, he wasn't lazy and he prepared something and it was on the table. Now what's on the table? And I, I think this is the, your question. Again, also, no, no, it's not on the table. Left and right, we are all agree that it's not on the table. So what's on the table? A technical solution of roadmap, page this or page this? I don't think. I don't think. To, I think that we have to learn from I mean, it's not. It was not a mistake what Dr. Berlin and other peacemakers did to pursue peace, to do whatever they can to have peace. The mistake is not to learn from our mistakes, not to prepare homework, and not to change it and to do something else, to bring some, I think, and I believe, the model has to deal with a regional solution, the Jordan, Egypt, Israel, I don't know what's going on now, even in Egypt, but we have to speak about the concepts. And Jordan, as I understand it, has a lot to do if she will know that America is backing her. If she will know that Israel is backing her. Not if it will be some, something that will put them in a situation that uh, all of the supporters of Israel were when Arafat entered to Judah and Samaria and killed all of the, those that cooperated with Israel. 
and, and or, or like it happened in south of Lebanon, when all of those that cooperated with Israel and Christians and so on, and we remember, were killed. It's a shame on Israel until today. So Jordan is not going to do <coughs> nothing if she will be the traitor of the Arab world. But if America and Israel, we, even in, in your institution, in another institution, if we'll prepare something, if we'll prepare something carefully, that based on other, on, on the paradigm shift that happened, we, we, I believe that we have to, to do something that it's not an independent Arab Palestinian state. I believe so. It's my, my faith. And if we prepare it, it will be on the table. Dr. Well, first a uh, technical remark. I mean, uh, we uh, began the Oslo process immediately after we changed the law which forbade us to talk to the PLO not one day before. It, in, in my view, it was a, a mistaken law, but uh, I respect even wrong laws in so my country. This is one thing. The second thing, is about Jordan. I'm not sure whether this idea of the Jordanian Palestinian state was a realistic one. We had only one opportunity to test it, and this was 11 of April 87, when there was an agreement between uh, Mr. Perez and King Hussein. Then he was the foreign minister. And by chance, I, I, this agreement is written uh, in my handwriting. And we came back. We couldn't believe ourselves that this was an agreement. I mean, I, I remember when, when the king was supporting it, I, I, I couldn't really believe uh, uh, myself. And we were sure, I must say naively, that we, when we come back from London, that the, the cabinet of 10, five Likud, five Labour, would embrace us, saying, actually, this is what we wanted. <laughs> and sure enough, there was one party which torpedoed it. Now, the same Israeli right is coming back to me and to my colleagues and say, hey, you remember 87? Maybe it was our fault. Can you perhaps try to check whether we can get back there? I'm telling you, Benny, with all due respect, it is impossible to get back there <coughs> and dreaming about the collapse of Abdallah and creating a Palestinian state <coughs> in Jordan. You know, it might happen, it might not happen, but this cannot be the hope of Israel. This cannot be the plan. You may say, in my view, it's okay if in a few years there will be a one-stage solution. We will annex or, or implement the Israeli law, which is actually the same, but we will do that. And we will take the risk of being a minority of Jews dominating the majority of Palestinians. The world will accept. This is something that I understand. I will fight against it, but I understand. But to say I have a solution, and the solution is in Jordan, and maybe I'll take the Americans and the Russians and others, and they will put pressure on the, on the, on the collapsing uh, uh, Jordan to accept the Palestinians. With all due respect, this is your plan. <clears throat> Let me um, just make a quick note on, on Jordan. Obviously, Jordan is under quite a bit of pressure right now. Uh, the Islamic Action Front, which is the Muslim Brotherhood arm in, in Jordan, appears to be really pressuring the regime. Things may change, uh, but I think you're right to say, Dr. Bailey, that, um, that that doesn't mean that it would change in a way that would uh, work out uh, for, for those who would propose this uh, Jordanian option. But this, I think, raises a broader question of um, the Arab Spring, or as many in Israel have called it to be, the Arab Winter. Um, the question there is, I mean, I've heard people talk about it in two different ways, that ultimately this is a good thing because it means that, you know, democratic ideas are bubbling up to the surface in the Arab world and that ultimately if Israel is to live side by side with all of its neighbors, it's going to have to do so with democracies 
I hate to quote Tom Friedman, who quotes himself plenty, but this whole idea of uh, two, two countries with McDonald's living one next to one another, this sort of democracy theory, um, that's the one way of approaching this. And then the other way is to say that you've got the Ikhwan, you've got the Muslim Brotherhood that is rising up uh, around the region, and that ultimately it will be impossible for the Israelis to make peace or to maintain peace with any of their neighbors, including, uh, including the Palestinians. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to hear just your thoughts about where the uh, Arab uprisings are taking all of this or how it might impact uh, your visions of, uh, of, uh, of peace in the region. I think we have to keep our hopes and our fears under control. I mean, it was Kissinger talking to Joe and Lyon in 1971 in one of their uncomfortable lapses in the conversation. Kissinger asked his Chinese counterpart what he thought the impact of the French Revolution would be on history. And this was in 1971, and Cho replied, it's too soon to tell. So the, the reality is that history has a very long arc in these matters. Building democracies that are stable, transparent, accountable is hard work. 22 countries in the world, 22 countries in the world have maintained their democratic character continuously since 1950. That's it. And by the way, India and Turkey do not belong and are not in that group, okay? The world's largest democracy is not in the group because for a brief period during the 70s, uh, the democratic process was, was suspended in India. So who knows what the outcome is going to be? What I do know, and what an honest man and woman knows, is that this has introduced yet another high level of uncertainty into the calculations of a still the greatest power on Earth, the United States, but weakening in terms of its capacity to project its military and political power abroad, and Israel. Again, tiny country, dark history, living on the night's edge. Who takes risks under these kinds of circumstances? If the Egyptian-Israeli peace <coughs> treaty goes south, the letter of it, you could hang a close for the season sign on any hope of an Israeli-Palestinian accord. And one other, since no one has mentioned the I word, uh, I will. Israel is now confronted with two realities, and it's sandwiched in the middle. One is in Egypt about which its future direction it has got to be very unclear and very worried about. And second, Iran, where the centrifuges continue to spin, where diplomacy will not work, where sanctions have not worked, which leaves the default position. Bomb, which may in itself not work, or accept the bomb. And since, final point, governing is about choosing, it seems to me, in this environment, who is going to take risks? Gentlemen, response? Yeah. <clears throat> it is true that it is premature to judge. Uh, and uh, this is something that even if we say that <clears throat> the, the uh, spring is winter, uh, we will not change the reality. It was not an Israeli uh, plan, I presume. Assume that it is not Israel behind it this, this time. And uh, we have to, uh, just to watch the reality and to see how can we uh, uh, benefit from it. Now, Israel in the past said that since there is no democracy in the Arab world, we cannot take the same risks for peace that we would have taken had there been peace. And the, the proponent of, of this policy is our Prime Minister, Netanyahu. This is what he always said. We have to take, get something more from the Arabs because they are not, not democracies. If there is a democracy, and we still don't know whether it is a democracy, uh, this argument will not exist. But the most important thing is that for the Arab leaders, who were democratically elected, but we do not know whether this democracy will be sustainable, for them, they know one thing, which was not known to their uh, predecessors, that there is a Tahrir, Tahrir Square somewhere. Mubarak never heard about the Tahrir Square. Neither Assad or others. They never heard about it. Now, there is a new reality, public opinion. And they will have to take it into consideration. Now we know 
that inciting the Arab public opinion about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the easiest thing. Not necessarily because this is the reason. Not be necessarily because it is fair. It is the easiest one. And we have to take it into consideration. Believing that because of the unknown factor in the Arab, uh, uh, Arab Spring, we can now wait, or should wait and see for some years, rather than working towards peace, will be the biggest mistake. Because here what we are doing is we are giving the leaders who want it, and to what, who want to divert the attention from what they are doing to the street, the easiest way, put it on our conscience. As, uh, as uh, it was said, we have to be very careful. No one knows uh, what's going on and what will be tomorrow. But first of all, if you have to be very careful, you have to be... Uh, I think yeah, we have to, to take things in proportions. There are maps here that they are distributed just to remind us where we are. The, the, the 21, 22, including the PLO, Arab League states, and not including Iran, but it's not in the Arab League. It's a Muslim state that we all know what Iran is, and they are all our neighbors, and they have more than 500 times territory, more than Israel, including Judah and Samaria, more than 500 times territory. The issue is not the territorial issue. I think that the Arab Spring forced us to have another spectrum, to, to raise our, our eyes, not to be stuck in the Gessele, in the alley, in the small street of Palestinian-Israel conflict. We have to see the global picture. And we have, uh, as Dr. Miller said, government of Israel and the whole world dealing now with uh, Iran. And when we see it, first of all, and the most important thing for government in Israel is really to be careful and to have things in proportions. I also expect the world to understand some proportions. When this one house in an outpost in, in, in Israel takes more uh, attention than uh, uh, then I don't know what. So things have to be in proportions. Where is the real risk? Who is really isolated by so by such hatred around? And uh, again and again, when I see the Arab Spring, it, it gives me the, the question that I, the, the issue that I raised in the beginning. The pan-Islamic is more strong than the self-identity and the self-determination, national, secular determination of the Palestinian state. It was a little bit uh, after the orientation of Ba'ath and other secular states, but it's all gone. So maybe we have to think again. Not maybe, we have to think again. We have to see how they see themselves. Now, democracy, by big mistake of, of many is just, they think that it's just the ruling of the majority. So they say, okay, we have elections, and we saw what are the results of the elections in Gaza, Hamas took over. The, result, the elections in Egypt, so it's democracy. No, democracy is values, it's not just majority. There are rights to minority, there are values that you have to rule. And in this meaning, they are so far away from it. So as I'm saying again, I think that the Arab Spring has to, to force us to, to prepare something, not just to sit down, that deals in, a, in, a, in the context of a regional solution, and to think about the mistakes that were done before. Palestinian identity, they have 21 Arab states, speaks Arabic, Muslims, is it the most important thing to have another one by itself? Is it the most important thing for them? Is it the most important thing for us? Isn't it the obstacle for peace in our region? We have 
to think about this. I think the wrong thing was the creating of independent Palestinian state virtually. It's not officially yet, but creating it. And we have to have repentance in this thing. OK, we've got a, uh, um, we're going to interrupt for a moment. We have uh, Congressman Sherman from California who would like to call up for a moment uh, to address us. If you'd like to come up, sir. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Uh, you have a, an outstanding panel to listen to. Uh, I'm Brad Sherman from California's best named city, Sherman Oaks. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Oslo envisions two states. There is pressure, particularly from liberal American Jews on Israel, to immediately make all the concessions necessary so that we can be proud of Israel's uh, reasonableness and generosity, which is odd for a diaspora community with so many lawyers like myself who never in their private negotiations ever make all the concessions before they actually reach the negotiating room. The other side uh, agreed to two states, and the assumption was that that meant a Jewish state and an Arab state. Hamas rejects two states, but Fatah is given the credit for accepting a two-state solution. Except when you look at the details, which is that they hold to the idea that any Arabic-speaking person who claims, because there are no records, that they or any of their ancestors ever lived in Eretz Israel has a right to return to the place they have never seen with their entire extended family. Uh, that is an acceptance of Israel as a state as long as it is an Arab state. Uh, the second uh, extreme dichotomy in the criticism is that Israel faces uh, criticism any time an IDF member doesn't make even more extraordinary risks of his or her own life in order to minimize uh, civilian casualties? Does the person approaching their position harbor a bomb, or is that a baby in the baby carriage? How close do they get? How many warnings do they ignore? If they don't make the right decision, they're criticized for not risking their life to avoid what may turn out to be a civilian casualty. We must look at the other side where uh, the, their fighters show uh, personal courage in uh, risking their lives in order to maximize Israeli civilian casualties. Uh, every missile that is filed, uh, fired at Sturdo, uh, Sturdo, uh, my pronunciation is terrible, uh, at any Israeli town is fired by someone risking their own life one way or another, and their sole purpose is to kill as many Israeli women and children as possible. I think if we can get home to the world, bring home to the world and to the American population, and even to some in the Jewish community here in the United States, those two dichotomies, then we'll have a clearer view of what's happening in the Middle East. And I look forward to the day when Oslo uh, is reborn, but uh, only with its original plan, two secure states for two people and, uh, and, and safe and secure borders. Um, Thank you for coming all the way to Washington, and uh, thank you for Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to just take a few questions from the audience. Uh, I see a few. What we're going to try to do is we're going to do them in bunches uh, so that we can get through as many of them as we can. Uh, and then I will try to close this out with one question that I'd like everybody to answer, and that's how we'll, I think, try to end this. So we'll start in the back. We'll go here and then right here. We'll take those three to start with, and then uh, we'll see how we're doing on time. Yes, sir. Hi. First of all, after the October, there were some events in the region that were very different. In the last years, were in 2000 and 2005, and and so I wonder what were the reasons in the favor of this uh, attempt? And 
and the second is the comment. I think that uh, I have heard that there is not a real leadership in the Israeli side. I think that Netanyahu's uh, death has freed the, the settlement. Settlements, and uh, in addition, the bar last speech it's also kind of uh, leadership side for the leadership in the only Israeli side. Okay, thank you. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that we keep our questions in the form of questions and nice and short. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I have a sort of basic question. Uh, 20 years from Oslo, in 20 years, about 50 years, we have peace with the Arabs. What if the Jews gave back all their settlements like they did in Gaza? Does it bring peace? Okay, and the third one over here. Hi, I'm David Barthomny with I'm with Unruh. And um, Dennis, I was wondering your thoughts on Dennis Ross's idea of opening up Area C for Palestinian development as a way of Israel extending its hands to the PA uh, to bring them to negotiate. Okay, three questions. Feel free to address as you wish, gentlemen. Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a Boston owner. Um, I'm 708, 0809. Um, the same three conditions apply, it seems to me. If you look at when breakthroughs occur in the Israeli conflict, they occur in moments of when, when there are compelling, a compelling amount of pain or alternatively a compelling amount of gain. There have only been three breakthroughs in the entire history of the Arab Israeli conflict. We had Kissinger's disengagement agreements preceded by the October War. He had Jimmy Carter's Camp David which was driven by Sadat, but again, because of the war, war and diplomacy. You had Baker's breakthrough in Madrid, which was preceded by the first Gulf War. You had Oslo, which was driven in large part by the first Palestinian spot, and Rabin's realization that there was no military solution to the Palestinian cause. Nothing will move in this process in a fundamental way until there is pain, accompanied by the prospects of real gain. Otherwise, we're going to be having the same conversation next year and, and the year after. As to the question of uh, what uh, might happen in the West Bank if we uh, destroy the settlements there as we did in, in Gaza? That was not the question. So, so please clarify. That is not the question. Please. The question was very simple. 20 years, 59 years, we don't have peace with the Palestinians, with the Arabs, 250 million surrounding you. If you gave them back almost all their demands, like killing all the settlers, <coughs> like you did in Gaza and got peace there. My dear, who did it was Mr. Sharon. Sharon would have been here a, a guest of honor 10 years ago. He was the actually mentor of the settlements of Greater Israel, everything like that. But what happened to Shamir, who went to Madrid? What happened to Sharon, who, who was the first to speak about the Palestinian state? What happened to Olmert, who was one of the heads of the lobby for Greater Israel in the Likud? And what happened to, to Bibi Netanyahu, who, who is now the proponent of the two-state solution? I'm sure that you are thinking about it, because you are, you are people who are thinking. And you are asking yourself, what are we going to do now? We are against all the gods of the hawks in Israel. Because what? They, they prefer Palestinian state. And we are saying that it is an, a dead idea, that the two-state solution is a dead idea. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to, to give me a break. How did it happen that all these big hawks, including Dan Merito, and C.P. Livni, and you name it, Mayor Shitri, all these people who were my my uh, counterparts in the Knesset in the last more than 20 years, who said we have to, to keep Israel uh, bigger and uh, the, the, the Palestinians should have 22 countries, they don't have to have their own one. This is what they told me. What happened to them? They went nuts. They understand that there is no other solution <coughs> for the Jewish state. And this is why my, uh, my question is not about peace. If you divide the land, and you give up on these settlements. You may have peace, and maybe not, but you will have a Jewish state. And this is maybe the difference between us. Because you want to prove to me that peace is very difficult and maybe not happen. 
And you can show me, by the way, books, not only in Palestine, but in Jordan and in, in Egypt. Give me one book in their schools which portrays a map of Israel. Neither of them. And you can tell me, Yossi, what are you doing? You're so naive. You're making peace with the Arabs and they don't love you. But what I can tell you is that my main idea is to have a Jewish sustainable state which will be able to have contracts with its neighbors. And whether it is cold peace or warm peace, even if I have to sometimes accept the fact that I hate, I prefer it rather than the current situation. And I'm telling you very frankly, if your aim is to support Israel in the status quo and to convince my kids, don't do anything because there is an Arab Spring and they don't love you and this happened and that happened and look what they did and look what is there in their books. <coughs> you are not my friends and you are not my supporters. I ask again. No, 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 sir, 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 he, I answer, he answered your question to the best of his ability. We'll let uh, Rabbi Alon uh, answer. Yeah, I, I, I uh, just briefly. Uh, I know that Dr. Miller didn't mean when he spoke about pain as the only catalyz catalyzator to the peace process. Uh, but I, I think that this is, um, if it will be like this, it will come to the same place that it is now. I mean, and, and I'll explain myself. I, you didn't say it, but peace that comes just because of threatening and terrorizing and terrifying the other side. You see? You didn't do nothing, so you'll see how, how, much, it, how much pain I can cause you. It's not a real peace. This is the peaceful land, means our neighbors don't need peace. They need land. We don't need land. It's just real estate. It's not the holy land, it's not important for us. We need peace because we are so weak and they kill us so much and it's such a painful. Mm, this is not peace and this is nothing and that's, this caused this situation. And, uh, and as I said, we have to prepare our home. <coughs> Arik Sharon, so you know, Dr. Bellin, he fired me from the cabinet in order to have, <laughs> in order to have majority for this stupidity, stupidity of unilateral, unilateral, no peace, nothing, and he created the Hamas state. But why did he do it? Why? I'll tell you. Because, I'm sorry to say it, and maybe I'll conclude with this because we have to conclude with good words to our host and to the capital as, as an American uh, <laughs> uh, representative, this concept. I don't blame America, not in Oslo, not in the unilateral disengagement. I think that America was surprised or disappointed. I blame my colleagues. I think they did not do their homework. Those hawkish that you said, if you know the demographic problem, all of a sudden they understood that there is a demographic problem, it's ridiculous. They didn't have other plans. They were under pressure of pain, as you said, under diplomatic and political pressures from other places, but there, each one of them did his mistake I think, but what we are trying now to prevent, but not preparing real options in advance. I spoke with Alex Sharon many times before he did this thing, and I quoted him, as you said, I gave him, I gave him interviews, how he spoke about the right option of Jordan, and how he spoke about the game, about Gaza, and about all of those things. He said, listen, things that you see from this place, you don't see from this place, this is not an excuse. You knew when you were in this chair that you are going to be prime minister once, and you knew that uh, the prime ministers are under pressure. So you had to prepare your homework. That's why I'm here, and that's why I think it's so important to be here and to think together what's going 
to be in the day that we come. Maybe we can't do it now. We need a chance. We need to be ready for the chance that will come. And maybe it will come sooner than we spoke about Jordan. Who knows what will be there? So we are going to sit like this and to lose Jordan to the Brotherhood, the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Maybe the majority of Palestinians in Jordan, in conjunction with the kingdom, that it's a little bit more moderated than others, can change it in advance. If we should do it together, we have to do what we have to do in advance, not to wait to the pain, not to wait to the pressures. Because of this, I think my colleagues were wrong. I don't blame America. America, what can I expect uh, America if uh, really, if they have, uh, they cannot be more, more uh, righteous than the pop, and the pop is my Jewish prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the interest of time, we, we are going to wrap up here. I have a final three-part question for all of you, and I hope you can answer it in less than a minute of this. Uh, and here is the question. Moving forward, we've, we've looked at problems, we've looked at the, the flaws, we've looked at the positive aspects of all this. The, the question simply is, now what? And why, why is three parts? Now what for Israel? Now what for the Palestinians? Now what for the United States? Moving forward, as quickly as you can, if you're to summarize your position right now, where should all three of these actors go? Dr. Bailey. For the Americans, is despite of the coming elections to try and be in the region and help us both to do something. The common denominator, I believe, of all of us is that the, the United States gave up on us, on us Palestinians and Israelis. And it is very difficult to go on without such a help. For the Israelis, I believe that one should go as soon as possible for a permanent agreement. It is impossible today because we have a, a government which was democratically elected and which is not ready to pay the price that somebody like myself is ready to pay. As a result of it, I think that it, is the, it should be an Israeli initiation to suggest at least an interim uh, phase which it already agreed in the past, and this is the second uh, phase of the roadmap. For the Palestinians, I believe that they have to trigger something in order for all of us to move. I respect very much the strategic decision of, of, uh, of Mahmoud Abbas, never to use violence. And he said it very clearly. <coughs> when violence is not a trigger, regretfully, <coughs> violence is the, is the most important trigger because most of us decision makers in the past or in the, in the present are, are firefighters more than anything else. So when there is fight, uh, 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 when there is fire, we fight. If there is no fire, we don't fight. Here, I believe that for them, if I may consult anybody, the best way is to say, Oslo was an interim agreement for five years. We never spoke about two states in Oslo. It was mentioned here. This was not even the idea of Rabin and others. We had an interim agreement for five years. It ended 15 years ago. I think that if the Palestinians are now telling us it's over, take our, our keys, we are not going to remain a quasi-government quasi or something like this. You are occupying our land. You believe that it is not occupation but liberation. Zeigesund, be well, be happy. We are under your occupation. This might trigger something. If this doesn't happen, or something like that, I believe that we might meet here in a year or five years and speak about the same things and nothing will move. Yeah. You know, look, I consider myself an honest human being. Failure has a way of teaching, teaching these things. Um, and I'll say it very clearly, and I'll choose my words very carefully, so do not misquote me. The prospects of a conflict-ending agreement, and I'm going to say it again, the prospects of a conflict-ending agreement which conclusively resolves the five core issues that drive the Israeli-Palestinian conflict 
is now, now, not possible. I, I don't know how else to express this view. It's not possible. Jerusalem, border, security, refugees, and the recognition of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, all of these issues cannot be resolved now among the three or four, if Mitt Romney happens to be the next president of the United States. Therefore, I don't know what the future is. I would suggest the following. Keep the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty at least at the spirit has been dead for a long time. Keep the letter alive. Number two, keep Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation as robust and as mutually beneficial as possible. Three, make sure that the infrastructure that Salam Fayyad has constructed, these institutions of the putative Palestinian state, or whatever you want to describe it as, <coughs> remain intact. Do what you can to promote economic development in the territories in order to address pressing economic needs with respect to the West Bank. And finally, if in fact Abbas and Netanyahu are serious about dealing with the political issues, engage in a quiet, discreet process which tests the proposition that I'm wrong. If you ask me, Ultimately, what the next five years will bring, it'll be this. The Israelis will keep their state for sure. But the Arabs and the Palestinians are not going to let them enjoy it. I'll start with the Palestinians. I, I want, uh, I wish, and I wish that I'm not a wishful thinker, uh, that uh, they will understand that we have to learn, like everyone has to learn, the limits of power, and they will uh, understand that uh, the, the game of independence, it's not the most existential thing for them. They can have it maybe in the UN in a month. They can try again. President Obama warned them not to do it. I don't know if they will do it or not, but this is not the most existential things, thing for them. In '48, all of those that lost uh, their homes uh, because of the transfer of populations that was in this area, uh, they didn't lose a state that never had. They had. They lost dignity, they lost homes. They had to deal with it. And we have to help them to deal with it. Not everything is politics. Not everything is just self-determination and, and things like this. I don't want to say that it's not important. Rights are rights, and they have to have all of the civil rights and also. And if they will understand that they have to do it with their brothers in Jordan, and they are the same, same families. Two, one hour, one hour car distance, Amman and Jerusalem. This is the whole thing. So together, we can come to something. What I want from Israel, meantime, to be very careful not to do mistakes that they did before, not to, to, to give up and to give in uh, land for territory, land for Hamas state, just to be careful. Uh, and in the same time, as it was said, to have discreet, negotiations with Palestinians, with Jordanians, with uh, Egyptians, if it's possible in the new situation, it has to be about a regional solution. And from America, first of all, I wish you all the best in the coming elections. <laughs> I, don't have to, I don't have to vote. I will just say that maybe I'm naive, but I think that we used to blame this president or this president. Many of the things are, you can see something that goes beyond all of the presidents, and I call it the State Department. Uh, and I think, and I and I think that it makes sense. After all, America is an empire, and empire cannot be dependent in the Middle East on one side. It, this, in spite of the wrong words that Taylor Engel said, Congressman Engel. 
And uh, I'm not so optimist. I mean, I hope and wish and pray that a good change will be. I don't want to take side. It's not nice. I'm a foreigner. But I'm just saying that it won't change everything from side to side. We are not naive. We saw in the future, in the past, I'm sorry. We have to be ready to deal with the State Department. And we know it. We could prepare on a long time ago. We had it in so many situations. When Shamir was in the, if you remember, the Iraq, uh, the Gulf War. So we, the only thing that he was asked, we had a coalition with Syria, just be quiet. Then the coalition was against Syria. Then it was a coalition. But always, always, in the beginning, it was a coalition of monarchies. But always, it has to be some coalition that Israel is not part of it, and Israel. And they have their strategy. We are not naive. I don't think that America is going to be Israel. But it is, thank God, that this is the only empire in the world, and not uh, other states that uh, this is the best. We, we, we don't have real kinship like we have with millions, grassroots, in America. And it's more than politics and more than everything else. It's not the Jewish community only that they are 2% of the population. Absolutely not. And you saw the Congress members from the Republicans and from the Democrats. It's real kinship with millions and millions of Americans that share with us values and they share with us the Bible. And I think this is the most important thing, more important than who is running the State Department, but the State Department is also important. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, I hope that you found the, uh, the panels as interesting as I did. I think it's very important that we continue this conversation and that we don't let this issue uh, die in our conscience uh, over the next few years. Um, clearly this, this uh, issue won't be solved today, but uh, we certainly need to keep working on it. So thank you very much thank and you. Uh, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.